I think I'll lead us in our uh, first reading from uh, Psalm 103, verse 8 to 13. Uh, we see a beautiful uh, mirroring here in Psalm 103 of the grace and compassion of God that we see in Galatians chapter 2. Um, boys and girls, if you're, if you're here today and you didn't bring a Bible, there are pew Bibles, uh, the black ones under many of the chairs and in, 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 in front of many of the pews. If you don't have one, you're welcome to open one up and turn with me to Psalm 103. Uh, as I say to some of the, the BYG and campers I've worked with, if you want to find the Psalms, you see you're in grade five or six, if you can't, just open that one right in the middle and you'll find the Psalms right there. Just open right in the middle and usually that will open up to one of the Psalms in the center of the Bible. So the first reading today is Psalm 103 and we'll start in verse eight. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, Abounding in love, he will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And uh, boys and girls, we're going to Galatians, so you can go to the right of your Bible, go all the way to the right, almost at the very end. There's uh, four books there, uh, four letters to the churches, and one of them is Galatians. And you can look and find that. And we're going to go to Galatians chapter 2. And we're going to start in verse 15. Galatians 2 and verse 15. Paul is saying these words to Peter and a crowd of people who are there. He says, We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles... Know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law no one will be justified. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not, Paul says. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I would really be a lawbreaker. And then he summarizes, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Well, let's bow down. Let us pray. Well, oh, gracious God, it's good to be in your house together, raising our voices in song. We thank you for the encouragement and joy it is, Lord, to be in worship together. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And Father, we thank you this morning for your word, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path. And Lord, in the busyness and different schedules of this last week, we pray that you will send your Holy Spirit upon our minds and upon our hearts, that we may be able to hear and receive that which you wish to teach us this morning and that receiving that, we may be changed and go with joy to do your will in this week ahead. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Coming to the end of the sermon series called Grace Riot this morning. Grace Riot. This is Galatians chapter 1 and Galatians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul is very fired up about defending the gospel of grace. 
Remember, he looks at the reality of the gospel in uh, verses three. He says, Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins, uh, ch verse, ch chapter one, verse three, to rescue us from this present evil age, the reality of the gospel. He talks in 1.12 about the source of the gospel. I didn't receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation of the Lord Jesus. He talks about how the gospel can be distorted in chapter one, how the gospel the beloved Galatian churches are receiving is no gospel at all. They've got it all backwards because people are in there twisting it around of the grace of God. And then in chapter two, remember, he uh, goes and he has the gospel confirmed by uh, those people, in the, the, the apostles in Jerusalem, and he has a meeting with them at the beginning of chapter two, and uh, all the work that he's been doing for 14 years, sharing about the grace of God in Jesus Christ and salvation in his name has not been in vain for the apostle Paul. Wonderful, excellent. And then the second half of chapter two, remember, he talks about living the gospel, and Peter, if you remember, uh, it, it has this very strange situation whereby he's, he, he, he's understood the gospel of grace, but Paul finds him not living it. He finds Peter pointing fingers and not behaving in, in, in a way that is in line with the gospel of grace. He is not eating anymore with people who call themselves Christian but are not doing Jewish things who are not following Jewish practices, but yet believe in Christ. And Peter says, no, uh, what they're doing is not true. It's not right. It's not good enough. Uh, you have to do more than just put your faith in Christ. And so Peter refuses, remember, to even eat with them, and he leaves. And so we have this huge kind of conflict, almost, this huge argument, this huge a thing in the end of chapter 2 of Galatians, which is kind of the theological core of the book of Galatians, where Paul, the newcomer, is correcting Peter, uh, the one on whom Christ said, my church will be built, about what the gospel actually is. It's an unbelievable chapter in chapter 2, Galatians chapter 2, in the early church. And we come today to this incredible kind of... Um, core to Paul's thinking, this incredible kind of explanation to how Paul understands the gospel and how we as Christians understand it today and how the Bible reveals the work of God in Jesus Christ. And Paul does not go skimp, he doesn't skimp on this now. He's in front of a public crowd with Peter, and he doesn't skimp on explaining the inner kind of definition and working of the gospel of grace, and in a way gives a definition of a Christian that lasts even to this day. Now, before we jump into what he says, we need to understand two things that are the background to this truth in the Bible uh, and to our own living and experience. Two things that are true all the time, in every place, in every time, and in every way, and which is the background here to the whole book of Galatians, indeed to Scripture itself. The two things that we know for certain and, and, and maybe you're, you're, you're new to the church today and you're just thinking about Christianity and we're so glad that you're here for that. But there's two foundational kind of things we need to understand before we jump into this chapter that is, is true for all time in every place and every, every person. That, that, that God is righteous and that we are not. That God is righteous and that we are not. And and the angst that the human feels, the searching that the human heart feels, the longing that the human heart feels in different ways and in different times and in different places, that, 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 that starts as early as Cain, remember, who, who, who commits sin maybe in a horrible way and then finds themselves as a restless wanderer. The, the human experience that you and I have where my heart is not always kind of right or settled or at peace and I feel guilt and shame and difficulty. The, the whole basis of the human condition in which we live is on this truth. God is righteous and we are not. And, and Peter in the early churches and the people who were preaching the wrong gospel to the Galatian churches thought they had an answer to this. And their answer was basically make yourself righteous by the good things you do. Which is a, a false gospel. That, that you and I, if we really look at our brains and at the hard wiring of our spiritual lives, you'll believe it or not, many of us, me included, will often have that as our default understanding of the gospel. 
That I must do good things to fix that separation between the righteousness of God and how I am not. But Paul is on a mission. Paul is fired up. It's like a riot, I said. The gospel letter of Galatians, if it was a, if it was a playlist, it would be loud. If it was street food, it would be hot and spicy. If it was a public demonstration, the letter of Galatians would be a riot. And Paul gets to the very core of the understanding of the gospel with this word that we'll look at, which is the word justified. In verse 16 and 17 and 20, it's the first time now he uses that word justified around being accepted by God, declared innocent before God in the work of Jesus. A truth that once the human heart receives and lets soaks in actually transforms everything we see about ourselves and those around us and God and changes you forever. In fact, it's like Jesus says, being born again. So, Paul gives us this big kind of explanation around the word justified. Are we ready for it? We're going to just fill the screen. Okay. What did I do with the notes this week? I just said this is a kind of a big argument he's making. So, I just threw the whole thing up there. Here it is. Four points. We're going to get through this. Don't worry. We will. Uh, We're not going to have an intermission in the middle of the sermon. Don't worry. No one is turned from alienation to acceptance with God by doing good things. Paul says we got to know that. Here's his argument. Because acceptance with God is through faith in Christ versus doing good things. That sounds easy to say, but hard for us to wire in our brains, believe it or not. Many of us are do-good things Christians as opposed to faith in Christ ones. Uh, It doesn't mean that a person does whatever. That's the Judaizers in Galatians saying, don't go by grace, because if you go by grace, people are just going to do whatever they want. We'll talk about that. That's an argument that's in the church. Thirdly, in fact, that's basically impossible for a Christian to do whatever they want, since the change God works in Christ is major. Every Christian's had a death and a resurrection. It's a spiritual mistake, finally, Paul says, to combine grace and merit. You can't and you don't need to. Okay, there's the whole sermon today. We're going to spend a few minutes on each point, okay? Here we go. We'll just walk through these verses. Very first thing Paul makes clear to Peter in the face of everyone in this unbelievably intense situation in the churches in Galatia is no one is turned from alienation to acceptance with God by doing good things. In verse 15, we who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles. Those sinful Gentiles who are not Jewish and not following the ways of God, he says... There are two ways here that Paul is talking about of being accepted by God. This right, this the fact that we are, God is righteous and we are not. There are two great ways that Paul is summarizing here. The first is to be justified or made acceptable to God by doing good things. Uh, And it says, we know a person is not justified by the works of the law. Paul says that's not how we're made acceptable to God. In that context, what are the works of the law? The works of the law for in that time are, uh, and for us, we look at the law, the, the Ten Commandments. We, we know all the Ten Commandments, right? We, we love God. We serve God. We, we, there are no other gods. We rever, revere God's name. We, 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 we keep the Lord's day holy. We avoid adultery, murder, theft, no false witnesses. The, the Jewish people at that time added on to the, to the law, the Ten Commandments, the the ceremonial law in addition to the moral law uh, about circumcision, about certain Jewish festivals, fasting, praying, alms. And there was this huge works, and, and so the phrase, we're not justified by the works of the law, is doing all of those things the law tells us to do in order to be righteous before God and in a way solve that human condition. And what Paul is saying to us is the truth of the matter is that this is a lie. If we are finding ourselves looking for peace, settlement, a sense of, a sense of um, being justified before God, if we're trying to do that by doing good things, it's a lie. Satan is the father of lies. Greg, you'll only be valuable or loved by God if you... Do all the right things. If you're the the best possible person every single day of the week, Greg, you'll only be loved and accepted by God if you you speak and say all the right things at all times and all places, if you're kind to everyone all the time. 
which many of you have driven behind me or beside me on the road, know that I'm not nice all the time. It's a lie that is rooted deep down in your heart and in my heart that if I just pull up my socks, if I, if I, if I just get my act together, or even better, if that person over there just gets their act together, then God will really love them and they'll be kind of right. That's, that's like the biggest lie, spiritually speaking, in, uh, in, in our time and since the time of Paul. And, and, and the works of the law, Paul says, begin to replace grace. How do I know if I'm going by the works of the law? How do I know that I'm on the treadmill of the works of the law, having to always do good things to please God? Well, maybe you have a sense, a lack of peace in your heart. Maybe if you look deep, there's spiritual turmoil in your life. Maybe your soul is at unrest. Maybe you focus constantly on the outward things that I must do or on the wrong things that other people are doing. Maybe you have deep in your life a striving for acceptance. Maybe you sense struggle or discontent. Maybe you have a lack of uh, identity or purpose in your life because we're always trying to find it and shape it and do it ourselves as opposed to rest in a Savior who truly loves you. Paul says, no way, there's no way you can be justified by the works of the law. On the other hand, Paul says in these verses, it is by faith in Christ. It's us looking to Jesus who died for us, the perfect life, his death is totally sufficient. On the cross he died, he rose again. And Paul says the amazing truth of God's work in this universe and in, 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 the, in the history of salvation is for the human heart turned by the Holy Spirit to simply put their trust in Jesus. And it's not about putting enough trust in Jesus or being spiritual enough or, or saying the right thing or saying the right prayer. It is simply, Paul says, uh, putting our faith in Christ. Two things, he says, you can try to become acceptable to God by doing good things or by putting your faith by the work of God in Jesus Christ. Paul says, of course, the only way for us to become right with God, acceptable to God, the only way for us to know the grace of God and to receive the life God gives is to put our trust in Jesus Christ and to put our faith there and to hope in him. And to be turned to him who died for us. Okay, well, the Judaizers, those who are kind of giving a different gospel in, in Galatians about you got you to pull up your socks if you want to be right in God's eyes. They have a, a criticism of Paul's argument. They, they push back. And here it is. It says, uh, well, they say in verse 17, well, because with God, acceptance with God is through faith in Christ versus doing good things. They say to Paul in the background this whole time, they're chirping. Doesn't it mean then that a person does whatever? Isn't the problem with really, truly allowing the grace of God to be the background music of my life first and foremost, doesn't that mean the people say to Paul that people will just do whatever they want? If you stop having to try to be the very best person you can, if you get rid of a sense of it's not moral responsibility, aren't people just going to go crazy? Isn't that person just going to do whatever they want? They don't deserve to do whatever they want. You know, you, you, have to be, you, you have to be doing what's right all the time. Paul is, uh, Paul is, 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 is trying to argue with the, with the people, um, the Judaizers. He's trying to, he's trying to say, that's your argument. And he says back to them, look, uh, even if I look to Christ first for acceptance with God, as opposed to being on the treadmill of having to do more and more and more deep down so that I have a sense of God's love and forgiveness and being good enough for God, uh, that, Paul says, does not promote sin. That doesn't make me sin more. That doesn't make me be a person who has no sense of moral responsibility. He just does kind of whatever I want at any time and at every place. Absolutely not, he says. Whew. He says, justification by faith, this work that God does in me, is major. It's, it's a really big change. It's a change of status. There's a big thing that happens here. He says, it's basically impossible to happen in my life what you say is going to happen 
uh, Judaizers. If I rebuild and uh, if I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. If I rebuild, says Paul, and I return to being a person who, who, who looks to pleasing God and looking for peace in my heart by being good enough and by being right, if I go in that direction, I'm actually tearing down all of this stuff that Christ has done. So Paul says, look, it's impossible. Those who have looked to Christ and received justification uh, in his name by trusting in him, it's a major change. He says, in fact, that's basically impossible. Your argument doesn't hold any water since the change God works in Christ, in me, is major. I'm changed. The Christian is a changed person, Paul says. So much so that every Christian, he says in these verses, has had a death and a resurrection. Is that a death and a resurrection? I don't really like funerals. I don't like them. I, I go to them. I do funerals. Uh, I don't really like death all that much. It doesn't inspire me. But maybe you've been to a funeral recently or, or been near death recently. Paul is talking about a major event here. He's talking about every Christian having a death and a resurrection. Maybe you are have been discovering Christianity, thinking about Christianity. Maybe you find you felt your own heart drawn to the Christian life, what it's all about. Maybe you've been in the church for since you were like zero or one, and it's like, I'm not sure I really am interested in this Christianity thing. I'm not sure it's for me. There's problems with it. Um, you know, my, my parents believe it, but I maybe don't. Or, you know, my heart is really set on other things. Um, you know, maybe, maybe that's, that's where you are today, and if you're here, we're so glad that you're here, and one of the key questions you can ask yourself if you're doing a spiritual inventory, if you're on a spiritual journey, if you're thinking about what all this means, you can ask yourself, have I died? Have I been risen to new life? And in these verses, 19 and 20, Paul is really getting to the very, very center of what Christianity is and what the work of Jesus is really about. So listen to this. He says in verse 19, this idea that every Christian first major change has died. He says, for through the law, I died to the law. There's a death word. And then he says in verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. There's a dying word. He says, uh, the life I live in the body, I now live elsewhere. That's kind of a, a dying word as well. I no longer live, he says. I, I no longer live. Have you ever thought of Christianity as a, a religion where you no longer live? <laughs> Christianity is a religion where you die? Uh, what does that mean when he says, I die to the law, I no longer live? What, what's Paul mean by that? It's kind of a heavy theological phrase for a summer weekend in July, isn't it? <laughs> I didn't write this. This is a beautiful core passage. What does he mean here, dying? He says, am I going to get rid of the law of God? <laughs> does it mean that all the ways that God tells us to live in society and on which our own society is built, the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, civil law, moral law, does he mean that uh, all the things I read in the Bible about um, living a righteous life and um, living a life that blesses others and blesses God and brings fruitfulness and brings flourishing, the law, the law of the Lord is perfect, we read in the Psalms, reviving the soul, the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy. Is Paul saying, I died to the law and, and I'm getting rid of all this whole category of stuff in Christianity, which is a way to live? Am, am I getting rid of a, an ethical imperative that leads to a good life that is a good life? No, Paul's not saying I take the law out of my life. Uh, we read in Romans that the heart is meant to delight in the law of God, Romans chapter 7. A sign of someone who has not put their faith in Christ is someone who does not follow God's law. So what's Paul saying here? Well, Paul's saying... When he died to the law, he's saying he's died to the law and all those ways in which we want to live but cannot and ought to but aren't able to. 
Um, he's saying that I died to the law as the standard of, of righteousness that I can never meet. So, so I, I died to that way of thinking that's hardwired in my brain that uh, I, I, I have this standard of, of, of doing the right things that I must absolutely meet in order for my life to be whole, for me to be good enough, for my kids to be good enough, for people around me to be good enough. I've died to this idea, to the law being the standard. Instead, he says, every Christian has had a resurrection. And uh, have you had a resurrection? Again, if you're just thinking about Christianity, Christianity is a religion where you rise again now. <laughs> in your heart, you die and you rise again in a way in, in, in your own life. Not, not like historically, it's not like, it's not like we're, we're, we're physically going through the, the, the crucifixion of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus, but it's happening spiritually. It's happening emotionally. It's happening inwardly. It's happening in me. Every Christian has had a resurrection. Look at the words. It says, I, 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 I live for God, it says. I, 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 I no longer, but Christ lives in me, it says in verse 20. Uh, the life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God. In one sense, we live a new, a new life, uh, but in another, it's Jesus who lives in us. And friends, the Christian life, and Paul is trying to drive this into Peter's head. Uh, like me, he had a thick skull. <laughs> Paul is trying to drive this into Peter's head over and over again about justification by faith. That in one sense, you know, I'm living here as a Christian by the grace of God. But in another real sense, it's Christ living in me. You know, I got a bad habit of turning on the streaming platform sometime and, and I'm thinking, okay, what does this mean, Christ living in me? And so I, I turned on one of these, I don't know, Transformer movies one time. And there was like some big machine up there climbing and looked like a person. And then, and then but the, there was a person inside the huge person controlling on the joysticks <laughs> and I move the arm and the huge arm would move and you move the arm and I don't know what movie it was but I turned it off after a few minutes is that what we're talking about Christ living in me like, like sitting in my heart in a joystick no it's talking about the way the Bible describes this is about the Christian being in Christ about Christ living in me and me abiding in him it's the paramount definition of a Christian in the Bible. Uh, the Christian has Christ living in them, and I am abiding in Christ. What, what, what does this mean for us? Well, it means on a, on a couple things this. It means that my, my faith, my trust is pointed towards Jesus. It means socially that I am connected as a Christian to other members of the body of Christ. When I, when I will have membership vows in a few minutes just now, and when I look at, at someone joining the church, I look at them by their first name. Yes, uh, Mitchell, for example, uh, gave it away. Sorry, Mitchell. Um, and, but I'll look at him in this moment as, as a brother, differently. It's being, it's, being, it's being socially connected to the others in the body of Christ. It's, it's faith. It's putting our trust in God. It's, it's spiritual, isn't it? It's, an, it's not sacramental through, 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 through ritual that I've done, but it's a spiritual union with Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. And friends, this, this rewires all of our brains because what we find in the end as we are justified and as we no longer use the law as our, as our standard for, for, for right, righteous living that we cannot meet and instead find ourselves dying and Christ living in us, the amazing gospel miracle truth. And believe me, this is true. If you're struggling today, and this sounds strange to you, with a sin, with a darkness, with a concern you can't get yourself out of, and you're like, this is, you know, this is, I, I'm never going to get out of this. I don't deserve to get out of this. Uh, I, I'm to blame. I'm wrong. If, if you're stuck in some of the devil's lies about this, understand this thing that uh, uh, to be a Christian is this, that, that it, 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 it's not that I, 
It's that I no longer want to do sin. It's that my heart has changed and my life has changed so that I no longer long for those things. Christ living in me spiritually and Christ living in you spiritually. The resurrection that I experience and you experience, and yes, we're meant to experience Christ, not just think about him. The experience is that when I'm, I, I'm alone late at night in front of the screen when I ought not to be or, or, or when I have this moment to, 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 to take something I shouldn't or to say something I shouldn't, the amazing miracle of the grace of God and salvation in Jesus' name, get this, is that I don't want to do that thing anymore. I hate it. Can you imagine the thing you're struggling with, the, the, the sin you don't want to do and which we're born into? And, and can you imagine your heart no longer longing for that thing, but longing instead to find yourself maybe face down in the throne room of the king? In the presence of God, your heart is exploding with the love of Christ, with the acceptance that he gives, with the comfort and peace he gives, with the assurance that he gives. Paul is saying to Peter, and he's saying to us, friends, it's so thin, and it's so weak, and it's so tired to think of a religion that is about you having to be better. Imagine the joy of a religion of a Savior who leaves heaven and takes on human flesh to transform me, to take away the power of sin in me. To make me desire whatever is pure and holy and good and trustworthy. Just picture someone you know who is like that. Picture a saint in your life. And can you have a sense? Well, just picture this. If you want to picture this relationship. Can you just picture someone you've had in your life around whom you have felt more affirmed and more loved and more valued and more right and more good and more hopeful and more joyful, and more, yeah, I'm right at the world. Picture that person. Was it a second grade teacher? What is a, a camp leader? Was it a husband or a wife? Is it, was it a, a person you met? Where at? Uh, think, think of that person. And you know, the joy of the gospel is that we are in union with Jesus <laughs> forever who is constantly drawing me into his life. Well, the very end of this passage, Galatians chapter 2, <laughs> the joyful wonders of the grace of the gospel is, is this. And the very last point is number four. Paul just reminds them at the very climax here. Listen, it's a spiritual mistake <laughs> in your own lives. If you're trying to grow spiritually, it's a spiritual mistake to combine grace and merit. You can't. He says. And what's more, you don't need to. Wow, okay. Well, he says in verse 21, I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. What's, what's Paul saying? He's talking about the grace of God. Grace riot. He's talking about the grace of God at the end of chapter 2. Don't set aside, he said, the grace of God. Don't nullify. I don't nullify, Paul says, the grace of God. Paul, who was like the, the most amazing Pharisee in, in his age, who knew all of the things to do right and follow, here he is saying, I don't set aside the grace of God. He says, for if you're, if you're living this whole life where you got to pull up your socks to be at peace with the living God, who will all meet one day face to face when Christ returns in Christ or not being in Christ. He says, he says if, if you're trying to live that life of, of righteousness being gained through the law, it, it, it's like he said, what about the death of Christ? The grace of God he ends with and the death of Christ he ends with. Don't set aside, he says, the sovereign grace of God. Don't set aside the grace of God in which we have been chosen and elected since eternity, loved since eternity. I don't set that grace aside. Could anyone set aside the sovereign grace of God? Can any of us here do that? <laughs> really? I don't know. I mean, the Bible talks about the very grace of God. When Jesus comes, he's revealed in John as the one who is full of grace 
and truth. Are you setting aside in your own life the grace of God? Uh, do you find yourself drinking deeply in your own life of, 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 of the love of God, of the goodness of God, of the transforming power of God? In your own life, have you compartmentalized things that you know God, you know God will never change or touch or help you with? That, that's part of it. That, 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 that's a part of self-saving, right? Or do you find yourself, uh, like at the end of verse 20, uh, dying with Christ, rising with life, and looking to a Savior who loves you. The life, I want to back up for one second. I live by faith in someone who loved me and gave himself for me. Is the grace of God, the work of God in Jesus, the background music, are you hardwired in that way? A Savior who died for you in all of your sinfulness, who died for you in all of your brokenness, who died for you in all of your re regret, if you have any today. Here's a Savior who died for us, uh, wicked folks who are unable to do what is right, yet a Savior has died for us. God himself has died for us on the cross to redeem us, to save us out of love. What Paul is saying to Peter, he's saying, Peter, you're living your life. You don't get Christianity, Peter. He said, Peter, you're always trying to make things yourself right in God's eyes by, by doing good things and making others do good things. You don't understand that when Christ lives in you, you want to do those things, and he, and, and he draws you to those things. And he says, Peter, look, if you're living that way, what you are effectively doing is you're combining grace and merit. And he said, you can't, you, you can't really do that, and you don't need to do it. Uh, we don't get anything if we combine grace and merit in our spiritual lives. We don't get anything. If we look to Christ, we get everything. If we try to combine his work with our work, we get nothing. Because we are, are sinful. We, we have nothing to offer God. You and I, when we come to God, all we bring to him not the weight of our faith, the strength of our accomplishments, all we bring to God is our sin. And what we receive is the love and acceptance of a Savior. Are you making the death of Christ nothing in your life? <laughs> Are you, are, you, are, you, are you living as if Christ died for nothing? Are you living as if those nails that went into his hands were for naught? Are you living, are you living as if his, the blood running out from his side was for, for nothing? He could have done it some other way. He could have given us a passport. <laughs> he couldn't have. Jesus died on the cross for us that we may live poor, broken sinners. Tim Keller puts it this way. He says, if we realize that we can't save ourselves, Christ's death will mean everything and we'll spend the rest of our lives in joyful service to him. That, that's the real question for us, I guess, as, as people here today. If we realize we can't save ourselves, and, and, and that's something we have to look really deep down in because I, I feel for myself looking through Galatians, I think for many of us in, growing up in the church or not growing up in the church, deep down we actually can function that way spiritually, that we think, in fact, we can save ourselves. But if we find ourselves and can get ourselves by the grace of God onto our knees before the living God, realizing that there is nothing that I can do <laughs> to make God love me. There's nothing I can do to please God. If we can realize deep down in the very center of my high school soul, of my college soul, of my woodworking, electrician, accountant, doctor, whatever soul, mothering soul, fathering soul, if we can look there and realize that there is nothing that you can do or I can do to make God love or accept me. The God who has made me from all eternity. You know, the purpose. Of my, there's nothing that I can do to save myself. If we can find ourselves there. And if you're a, a new Christian today or not a Christian today. If you can find yourselves sick of your sin. And sick of your wandering. And tired of looking other places because it didn't satisfy 
If you can find yourselves there on your knees, realizing that you cannot save yourself, redeem yourself, heal yourself, fix yourself, then what Paul's saying is the death of Jesus will mean absolutely everything to you. You know, I remember as a kid, uh, I don't know, a teenager, back when the Dead Sea was sick and I was a teenager, watching this movie about a Scottish historical movie, and this guy, William Wilberforce, I think, was brought into this public Scottish square in a cage to be killed. And people were throwing food at him and yelling at him and cursing him and spitting on him, and it was awful. And I remember I was like 16, 17, and I don't know what it was, but... um, I just had this moment. I, I, I was watching it on the sofa. I think it was by myself. And I remember the humiliation, the shame, the death that he was led to. And for whatever reason, I, I got down on my knees as a 16-year-old. <laughs> and I was like, wow, Jesus, if you did this for me, like, I want to live for you. And that's the power, in a way, of the, of, of the message of the gospel, the power of, of, of Jesus Christ who died for us. Paul doesn't beat Peter up. <laughs> Paul doesn't say, oh, you didn't get it right, Paul, uh, Peter, you messed it up. <laughs> what does Paul say to Peter? What does the Bible say to us? He says, you know, uh, Peter, you have the love of the king. What more do you need? Let's pray. Well, thank you, Lord. Thank you so very much for the letter of Galatians. <laughs> what a joy to walk through this with your church. Oh, thank you for the true, life-changing, transforming grace of God and the love of God. I pray, Lord, that we may not only know this grace and love, but that we may also experience it today, in this week ahead, in our relationships. Draw us ever closer to Jesus in everything we pray. Amen.